Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, so this panel is entitled to diversity in publishing from book to buyer. And we've got a fantastic panel here tonight. Um, my name is Ruth. I am one of the co-founders of the Literary Lancashire Award. I am also an MA student in literary studies and have also worked in uh, equality, diversity and inclusivity in the English literature department at Lancaster, working on Athena Swan and other such um, projects. So I will quickly ask the panel to kind of introduce themselves before we get started. Um, Laura, would you like to go first? Hello, Dick. Um, I'm Laura. I was the other founder of the uh, Literary Lancashire Award. Uh, I went to Lancaster University. I studied English literature and creative writing. And uh, that's about me, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you, Laura. Um, Sonali, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, I'm Sonali. I use pronouns she, her. I'm here in the capacity of a publisher, I guess, although I'm not currently working as a publisher. I have worked in Indian publishing for four years at organizations such as uh, Scholastic and Hachette. And I am currently doing a PhD in publishing from the University of Stirling. And I am also the co-chair of Society of Young Publishers Scotland, as well as the co-founder of the Selkie publication CIC, which exclusively publishes underrepresented voices. I mean, fantastic. And I know I follow Selkie Publications and you guys are doing such amazing work. Um, Kat, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, uh, my name is Kat Mitchell. I'm a lecturer in writing and publishing at the University of Derby. Uh, before doing that, I used to work in publishing myself um, for around five years. And four of those years were at Penguin Random House working in marketing and publicity. And at the moment, I'm doing some research into disability and publishing as well. Fantastic. Thank you, Kat. Uh, Benji, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Benji. Uh, I'm the least qualified person on this panel. Um, I'm an English language and creative writing student here at Lancaster, uh, hopefully soon to be master's student. Um, and I am at present the uh, sort of senior, we have two executive editors, I'm the technically senior executive editor of Flash Literary Journal, which is a publication focusing on students here at Lancaster. We do prose, poetry, hybrid pieces, um, and yeah, hoping to end up in the publishing industry at some point. Thank you. And also, Benji, you are in fact a writer and musician yourself, so don't play that down at all. Um, Jay Ram, would you like to introduce yourself? Um, hello everyone. Um, my name is Jayran and uh, Jayran, yes, I already said that. I just heard everyone's lovely intro and got a little bit nervous. Um, but I am a writer and I'm currently based in the Northwest. Um, I studied creative writing at Lancaster University and I currently work as a creative practitioner for the Dukes and my writing is mainly specified in theatre. However, I do also write for prose and um, I'm very passionate about this topic. So I'm very excited for this evening to talk to all of you. Thank you, Jayran. And I think as well, like your work with the Duke Theatre is also so important. And it's really good to get a diverse kind of representation across the industry, not just in kind of um, books and what we would normally consider the publishing industry. Um, so great, I think we'll leap straight in um, to the first section on who can write a book. And this is kind of looking at the writer side of the publishing industry, people who are able to get published and have their work seen on the marketplace. So just to kind of give a little background to this area. So while anyone has the ability to write and the right to write, um, this question is about the access to the industry itself. Um, so, for example, Dr. Melanie um, Ramachan, um, Bold's report for the Book Trust in 2019, revealed that only 5% of children's books creators identified as people of colour. So in this section, we want to talk about why is there such a distinctive racial inequality amongst UK authors? Um, are there problems of accessibility for authors reaching the publishing industry? And if so, what are they? And likewise, um, what can the publishing industry do to support young writers from diverse backgrounds? Um, so Benji and Jay ran as kind of our young writers, I would like to pass the floor over to you. Um, I don't mind who goes first, but just to kind of give your thoughts and perspectives. Do you want to start? 
Uh, I'm, I'm happy to. I'm happy for you to start. Uh, yeah. Dad, I'll just go. Let's go. Um, yeah, so I think I, I'm glad we uh, drew the distinction of, you know, anyone can write a book. Um, in terms of actually getting into the industry, I think, I mean, we, we have the we have the data right there. Ruth's just given us some good examples of it. There are barriers to people who don't fit certain descriptors. I mean, something that I'm always very aware of, especially in light of, you know, coming to university, becoming an adult, learning more about the world is, you know, I am a male presenting person. I don't fit any of the stereotypes that people put as being a queer man. So, you know, I, I am, I'm people, you know, I'm just a person. There is nothing about me that really is pointed to to qualify me as belonging to any particular group. And that means I'm presented with far fewer obstacles with with everything in life, really. But um, the biggest thing I've seen with that in publishing is that it just gives you this really intense awareness where, for example, at Flash, most of our team are women, but myself and the other executive editor are both men. And that's something I've always been acutely aware of. And, you know, that that was my choice to hire that executive editor. And I can sit here and quite confident say to myself that that wasn't any kind of unconscious bias, but that awareness, that sort of self-suspicion is always there. And I think addressing that starts with making it clear that that sort of discomfort that you feel with yourself initially when you start to ask these questions, especially someone who hasn't caught the wrong, who isn't on the wrong side of this, is that discomfort is there because you don't want to feel like you're part of the problem. So don't be. Hopefully that makes sense. I think that's a brilliant kind of some points to kick us off. Um, yeah, I don't know, Jaren, do you want to hop straight in? I mean, uh, carrying on from what Benji said, I think it really stems to the senior teams at these publishing companies and house, uh, uh, places. Um, nervous as again um because when it all trickles down and when you have that when you have the like the systemic um problems within publishing companies when those teams are primarily the traditional roots and they're seeking those traditional stories um what they think is going to be more marketable and more from you know these years and years and years of how it's been and it's just well at the end of the day, like I think something uh, we as writers, what we don't really take into account is it is a business at the end of the day. And we can write because we love and because we want to create and that's how it should be. But from these big corporations point of view, it's all about what's going to make money. And if something has been making money from their perspective for so long, then that's what they're primarily interested in. And as, you know, as writers, when we're coming into how can we get our books published? And if we have something that doesn't necessarily fit into that standard, it's quite easily dismissed. When, you know, I think now we're in a time where it is being encouraged. And I think social media has a big part to play with that because of this now, you know, seeking new stories and seeing diversity, but um, until until there's actual structural change, um, I think that kind of, it doesn't necessarily, as a writer, if you feel like, oh, that's the way it's always been, you don't always have an incentive to be like, well, what am I gonna do? I can't change anything, I'm just one person. If I go to an independent publishing company, is just going to be independent. My book's not actually going to be on a bookshelf. And I think that's a big problem, that that's where the change needs to happen. Um, just kind of following on from that, do you think that like there's anything publishers can actively do in kind of helping those young writers access the publishing industry? Is it something they need to look at in their own hiring practices or is it kind of something they can do you know outreach work or how is it that we can kind of support young writers in feeling they are able to write a book and have it published and it be marketable 
I think so. I think I was in preparation for this. I was reading up some statistics and um, I saw that for Penguin Random House, it was about 7% Hispanic, 8% Asian, 4% Black and 70% White um, workforce. Uh, and that includes the marketing teams as well and the editing teams. And if you don't have on you know, those ground level staff kind of reaching out to authors and reaching out to young writers, we don't necessarily know what it is that we have to do. What is that next step? We're encouraged to write. If you're lucky in school, you're encouraged to write if you have a good English teacher, but there's no, okay, go get your book published, but how? And there's no connection on that point. And I think that's where that bridge that bridge needs, uh, building the bridge needs to come from their end because we've been trying to build that bridge for a long time. So if I could uh, just add something onto that, um, I think Jeremy makes a very good point of um, making people feel that they, they can do this, they can do that, that next step element. Somewhere at, say, like Lancaster, there are parts of so our creative writing course there are things baked into that that are to help you get on to that sort of next step. You know, like this is how you approach publishers, this is how you write a letter to a publisher, that kind of thing. Um, but something to be acutely aware of there is that that's at a top 10 university that loves to tell you it's a top 10 university. So I'm not going to flag off Lancaster too much until here. Um, <laughs> and, you know, if you don't get to somewhere like here, for whatever reason, it might be because when you were in high school, you didn't have an immediate interest in reading or writing. And so entire educational, entire areas of the education system just gave up on you. And, you know, obviously that's going to happen more in uh, areas with high concentrations of people of colour because just less money goes there. You know, uh, less resources are put there. You you know, we see a lot of a 97% clubs and things like that starting because of the greater access that's given to people who go who go into private education, people who are born into higher amounts of wealth. And I think that is an incredibly important part of addressing it is there is always going to be a wealth element. And then that is further complicated by the fact that wealth is concentrated largely in particular people in society, largely white straight men. And I think tackling that element of wealth and targeting people in from the privileged background is also incredibly important. I mean, fantastic responses from um, both of you. And I guess kind of my last question to both of you, and if anyone else wants to weigh in, please do, um, is both of you, to my knowledge and experience of your writing, uh, quite experimental and don't always kind of stick to things like um, genre and kind of will play around with not just form, but content. Um, and I know Jaron was talking about how, you know, writing needs to be viewed as marketable to make it publishable in the first place. So do you guys think that kind of um, there needs to be a change in approach to how we teach creative writing as kind of like a creative exercise or as a publishing exercise? Like, how do you guys think that that divide between kind of creativity and the business can be tackled? Uh, it's, it is interesting because I, I want to clarify that um, uh, what I meant was um, that's kind of like how it's seen. That doesn't necessarily mean that I think that it's right um, because um, I think uh, going back to like, as you said, Ruth, like with creative writing as a subject, the title is being creative writing and yet we are marked based on the structure. If anyone thinks outside of the box, if anyone decides to do something post-dramatic or experiments with form, it's like, well, I can't mark that. And, but then, but then how do you, break it down to like an academic level so I think it, again it comes down to like this system and that is kind of what <laughs> what we need to change it sounds so cringy but it's true um, <laughs> um, and in terms of like being marketable I think because of social media and maybe I'm coming a bit too early in the panel with this but with recent events 
I think there's been more of a push for seeing work which isn't always like what we've been seeing and what we've had um kind of what's been there what's been already available there's like this thirst for representation and for diversity um and I think you we've seen um publishers kind of benefit off that and market off that with when black lives uh with the black lives matter movement um why I'm no longer talking about race I think is the name I'm really sorry if I got it wrong um that just skyrocketed off the because everyone they were like we have this book buy it everyone because they knew there was a marketing opportunity there and it it's twisted the way it's kind of gone about it um but I think it's shown that people are that can be marketable and it is marketable and it does make money and like it's difficult I think it's a very it's it's not a very black and white conversation and I don't even have an answer for it I'm just words are coming out because I'm like goodness where where do you start with that (laughs) I think it's not a black and white conversation is the perfect kind of summary for diversity in general like we can't kind of keep seeing things as black and white it's got to be more diverse than that Uh, Benji do you want to hop in uh yeah I think Geron raised a really great point about um the when you're on an academic course that involves any creative element it's going to be assessed grades are going to be applied to it which means creative work is being quantified a numerical value is being applied to it and so i can't imagine anything that would terrify any sort of management of university more than saying hey we're going to apply this quantified standardized form of marking to work based on how it tackles questions of race and you know that that's a very that can be a very scary thing. And I, I've always wondered about you know what what if there was creative writing module on stereotypes within certain genres. You know if if someone if a student comes forward and says I'm writing this horror script, um, here are my characters. I think there should be an awareness in the back of every scriptwriter's mind of okay, well how have how have people of color been represented in horror films? How are women always represented in horror films? You know you've got everything from screen queens to like the the black sidekick who always gets killed off um having a, a historical awareness of that and then working against it and, and as Jaron points out you know that then has to be quantified and marked in an academic context which i think is always going to be one of the biggest hurdles because it becomes about what points do we do we apply to this what what layer what layer in this system does this work fit into and i think Part of addressing that is getting rid of some of the fear of having those conversations. You know, obviously it, it, it can be incredibly painful at times um, for, for anyone who is affected by those issues. Um, but you, we have to, you know, that's why panels like this are so incredibly important. You have to actually talk about it so that you can make some progress towards. OK, here there are things that are facts that we've all agreed are facts. Here are things that are just opinion. Here's what's been is what's not and so i think in asking the question how do we actually do that more things like this i i would argue um brilliant i think um both of you have given such interesting starting points for this conversation um and with kind of the conclusion being that maybe it's the structural nature of how publishing works itself i think that's the perfect time um to go on to who edits books and kind of the next section of this discussion um so again just to give a little bit of background and um, this segment wants to explore kind of the editorial process and diversity in the workforce of publishing and um, so recent reports from the publishers association have shown that only 13 percent of employees identified as um black and other ethnic minorities among the publishing industry workforce um, and by comparison 6.6 identify as having a disability or impairment uh, while 10.3% of respondents identified as LGBTQ+. So kind of from that, um, how does the workforce in the publishing industry affect the diversity of the literary material that kind of we see on the uh, consumer as, consumer's end? Um, and is there a conscious or unconscious bias here that could affect that? Um, and is this problem unique to just 
larger publishers such as Penguin and Bloomsbury or does it also impact, impact independent presses as well? Um, so with that, I will pass over to Sonali and Kat, our resident experts in the publishing industry. Um, I can start first, that's all right. <laughs> um, yeah, just if I could start with actually a few points that I had, uh, which uh, Benji and Jiran really um, nicely brought up. Um, I first came to the UK to study a creative writing master's degree as well, which was at the University of Edinburgh. And education is one of the UK's biggest tourist, um, um, basically education tourism is one of the biggest uh, industries in the UK. And my class was very international. Um, I guess the biggest chunks were people from the US and the UK, but there were still many, many other international students from um, South Africa, from Netherlands, from Finland. There were a few of us from India, so uh, from someone from China. And one of the issues I faced was that the teaching was still very, very Western. And it only took a very selective view of what writing is supposed to be, what literature is supposed to be. So we also had some minor papers, which were literature modules, and the selections were very white and very old and stale at some points. I cannot believe I had to read Heart of Darkness again in my life and sit in class and discuss it, which is something I never wanted to do after my own undergraduate degree and have to discuss why this should be removed from all courses and it's not something okay to study anymore or talk about anymore. There's much better representation of Africa as if that's a very small place if you want to pick up. And also even just in my own creative writing uh, lectures and seminars and classes where my professors were great, but sometimes we just couldn't see eye to eye because Again, they had a limited understanding of what writing and literature can be because they've grown up in a certain canon. I am a multilingual speaker, writer. I will sometimes directly translate from my, other, my mother tongue Hindi in my head to English when I write. And I think as long as my meaning is clear, which it is, and as long as it's grammatically correct, which again it is, I have literally worked as an editor. I've literally edited dictionaries so I can safely say that my grammar is actually much better than a lot of people I meet here. But I would still not, I still did not see eye to eye with a lot of my professors who kept correcting my sentence structures because they weren't very familiar to them. But it is something that we use back home. It's Indian English or it's just English for us. And also the whole saying of show, don't tell, which sure works in lots of cases, but doesn't work in the oral tradition, for example, and there are ways around it, or your free tax pyramid, you don't have to always follow that narrative structure, there are ways around it. So there are issues at university level. And then what Jaron said about publishing being a business and then profiting out of certain movements and trends, I completely agree. I've worked on both sides. I've, I am a writer myself, and I also have worked in publishing. And when some famous celebrities used to pass away, our publisher, we, used ask, we as publishers used to start looking at our list being like, oh, do we have any biographies, autobiographies, any fun books about them that we can post now because people will suddenly want to buy David Bowie books, for example. Um, so yeah, I think talking about diversity is great and Black Lives Matter movement coming into publishing with the publishing paid me hashtag where white writers were selling, uh, were sharing their advance amounts and people working in publishing were sharing their salaries so that we could compare with people of color, for example, how they were disproportionately getting much less money. But my fear is that this is all just a trend. I think we'll talk about it. And again, talking about it is great because if we don't discuss these ideas, then they're not going to go anywhere. But there are numerous diversity panels. I am organizing a conference over the next two days at Society of Young Publishers Scotland. And of course, we have panels that discuss these issues as well, as well. But how do we take it to the next step? Because I do agree that um, it is a structural issue where the higher ups in publishing tend to be older white men. And while I've seen, even if you just talk about gender or sex, even if you start seeing that 
the editorial marketing team, for example, are now primarily women, actually, in most companies, they still don't tend to be the CEOs who are actually making the decisions at the end of the day about where the money goes, or the CFOs, or the directors, or the publishers. Those people still tend to be men. And I will throw in a little more <laughs> problem into this um, discussion where I have worked in international publishing, which engages very heavily with British publishing, because one thing that we forget when we talk about books here is that when UK, especially the big five in the UK or big four now, who knows what happens, what will happen to Salmon and Schuster. When they publish books, it is not only for this tiny island made up of 66 million people. Those books go out to the rest of the world. And with the neo-colonial setup, the US and the UK are in unique positions of power globally, where through Commonwealth rights and the US rights, their books go to the rest of the world and are consumed in other markets, such as India, where I'm from, but also you know, the African continent, Australia, China, Canada, etc. So what publishes here also impacts us. So I grew up reading primarily English language books primarily books by white authors, primarily books by men, because that was what was easily available in India. It is only recently that Indian literature is gaining some more ground, but the bestsellers in India still tend to be white American or British writers because those companies always have the biggest marketing budgets and whatever book makes the New York Times bestseller or wins the Costa or whatever tends to sell more too. So there is another issue where we as people of color in other countries are impacted by British publishing. And we don't get a say in it because, for example, if I wanted to get a job in the UK, it is extremely hard for me to get a work visa. Um, my only choice would be the big companies because they're the only ones who could support a work visa. The Indies, as much as they would like to hire, hire people who come from different backgrounds, they don't have the financial power with them to support these work visas and have a more diverse workforce. So that's where another issue comes in as well. And I think I've spoken enough, so I'm going to hand over to Kat now. Thank you. Uh, that was so interesting. And everyone's made such fascinating points so far. I've got, I've got so much <laughs> I want to say kind of in response to you all just to start with. Um, I think, first of all, I guess it's something that you've all touched on already is just the problem of, I guess, power and who gets to judge what has value being quite concentrated in a small number of people. I think that's a huge issue. And I think a part of that is the kind of number of gatekeepers there are from you as a writer, if we're thinking about it right from the start, all the way into reaching that reader at the end of the process. There's so many gatekeepers in the way to, to potentially stop you from reaching your readers. So, you know, we, we, we talked a little bit about school and maybe the school curriculum and, and universities and the way that universities decide what's valuable in terms of what, what books they teach. I remember being at university and at the end of term, and there being kind of a, a PowerPoint slide of all the authors that we'd learn about and they were all white. And in fact, actually, they were all men. And it, like the, the lecturer just turned and went, oh no, <laughs> I did not realize. And it just had not occurred to him that there was there was such a lack of diversity. And that was 10 years ago. Hopefully that, that has changed a little bit now, but probably still not enough. So there's kind of gatekeepers at university deciding what people read. And also from a creative writing perspective, what's valued as good writing that then they kind of encouraged um, that might then go on to get published. And then I think even before you get into what we traditionally think of as the publishing industry, so publishing houses like Penguin and Hachette, Bloomsbury, et cetera, you've got agents as well. And I think they're not often talked about enough as kind of really important gatekeepers to the industry, because usually to get published, an author needs to be represented by an agent first. They can't go directly to a publishing house, certainly not the big ones. And often agents come from white middle class backgrounds. They've got money behind them. So that's how they're able to kind of set up as an agent. Um, so that's the kind of big barrier, I think, for a lot of people entering the industry. Um, because as much as we like to think of publishing as 
driven by business and profits and people just look at sales figures. There is a lot of subjectivity involved. And I think if you have got a workforce in publishing houses, in, in agencies that aren't diverse, that isn't diverse, then they're not going to choose books that don't speak to them directly because there's going to be subjective bias towards books that feel familiar to them. So I think increasing the diversity of the workforce is, is a, a really, really crucial step towards increasing the diversity of the books that end up getting published and getting into readers' hands. Because I think the problem isn't the quality of the writing and the number of writers out there that all exists. It's it's actually getting them published and, and getting them to readers because the readers want them too. You know, there's definitely market markets for all types of diverse writing. Um, it's just that process isn't really working for everyone. So I think the kind of most crucial thing we can do is, is work on that publishing workforce and make it more diverse. Um, and I, yeah, I have a lot of ideas, <laughs> a lot of thoughts on how to do that. But I don't know if we, we're moving on to that next or if other people want to feed in first. I just wanted to add in something else that I was thinking when everyone else was talking as well, that I would consider myself liberal, left of center, etc. And that I would respect diverse voices. That's basically why my friends and I from our creative writing master's degree founded the Selkie. It's because we as co-founders didn't see people like us in publishing and literature. And we said we want to not only help ourselves by working in this process, but like give a platform to people who look like us or who've had similar experiences. And it's something I've learned through that. It's something I've learned through interactions with my friends that no matter how much you want to try to support these issues, we will always have blind spots as individuals. For example, I do not have any disabilities and one of my close friends is disabled. And sometimes I will make certain presumptions that completely would negate her concerns. And she has called me out on it and I've corrected myself, obviously, immediately. But I have to remind myself that there are certain things that just wouldn't strike me just because I have not experienced them myself. Similarly with her, where she was um, just, for example, she was a flatmate of mine and we were looking for new housemates and she had lined up a certain number of people to interview. And I just threw and I'm like, oh, just can you make sure that you don't get any right wingy vibes from them? Um, and, you know, they're not very like nationalistic or whatever. And she says, oh, no, but that shouldn't be a problem. Why? And anyway, and I said, well, because they'll be living with an Indian woman of color. I don't want to live with a racist. And it had just not simply struck her that that could be an issue for either those people or for me. So people do have these blind spots as well. So, yeah, just to add into the point that having one diversity hire, just like me as a woman of color, will not take all your diverse hire you know, boxes as well. I cannot represent or I cannot you know, think of the experiences of, like I mentioned, a disabled person or a queer person. You need to have just a generally diverse team that can speak to different experiences, not just one single diversity hire where you think you've done your job at the end of the day. Not having tokenism, just to add in, like, you know, it's not just, oh, we've ticked a box, great, we've done it. It's like, no, we need, like you said, across the board. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think not having tokenism is also all, also good for business because obviously people like us exist. Obviously, there are these markets that are that haven't been tapped as of as of yet, and as we've all mentioned, the traditions of what is canonical literature, what is considered standard in publishing, they have been going on for centuries. Okay, those markets are actually saturated. It's it actually makes bad business sense unless we have another new era in literature. You know, suddenly we have like a post post modern literature era or something. Unless that happens we are all writing or we are all reading and consuming the same kind of literature just vomited again and again. This is actually a, a business opportunity for publishers to tap into markets that haven't been tapped before. So this also just makes business sense, which I think is the right way to approach it with the people who are engaging in business and whose first priority has to be finances and financial health of their company. Um, yes, yeah, Sonali raises a really good point that um... I'm aware I read recently, but uh, th th there are a lot of statistics around lately of um, companies run by women 
nowadays tend to return higher profits than companies run by men on average, yet still far more companies are run by men than by women. Which, as Sonali phrases it, that makes that poor business sense. If you're looking purely at the numbers, you should be hiring a woman. Um, which obviously that that's a gross oversimplification. It's it's a much wider cultural issue of, you know, we, we we've been using the phrase these phrases, you know, like older white men like choosing like that kind of thing. Um something else I wanted to speak to that um something Sonali mentioned, um, you know, getting a visa to come over here to work in and any particular industry, publishing obviously is, is a key one. Um, to think that someone would come over here from a country like India or you know any country that had previously been part of the British Empire to find that now, what was it, was it last night, the night before, all government buildings in the UK now have to fly a union flag all the time, regardless of the circumstances. That that's got to that's got to feel odd. I mean, I, I was born and raised in the UK, and sometimes the union flag makes me a little bit of a little bit uncomfortable because of the connotations that it has picked up over the years. And um, I made that point because I think, in terms of like actionable things we can actually do, political power can't be undervalued as something that we use to actually create change. I mean, when you when you live in country like the uk that's held up as you know it's, it's a free country democracy all that but we recently had one of our major political parties accused of undermining its own elected leader regardless of what anyone's political leanings are that's terrifying we've now got uh legislation in parliament that might limit people's right to protest that is terrifying and i think you know as a uh, um jaron mentioned you know box ticking as being a thing just like, oh, we've done it that's it that that's in response to social and political pressure of you know why are you doing this why are people being underrepresented why are we still so not diverse and i think at the end of the day you, you have to consider political power as an element for that because there are so many companies that will just pick a box that will just do the bare minimum until something is brought to bear under the law and that means laws have to be changed for real equality to take hold. Um, and I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and tell anybody to sign up for one political party or another, but I think political power, engagement with a political system that pushes people out, particularly people who don't fit a certain description, is key. Um, yeah, I think what we're kind of saying about tokenism and, you know, um, movements kind of pushing for diversity but it only lasting kind of like a summer or a summer worth of protests is so true and felt by so many I know like me too was such a massive thing and yet it still hasn't meant that I've not been discriminated against for being a woman and still haven't experienced sexual harassment and you know catcalling and all of those things those things still exist um just before we move on I know Kat you mentioned you had some potential solutions um, to, to these um, issues we've been speaking to. I don't know if you want to expand on that a little bit further before we move on. Uh, I love that as if I'm going to just come <laughs> solve everything. Um, I, I guess, I don't know, suggestions for priorities maybe rather than solutions. I bet we all have opinions about, you know, different ways that things could be changed. Um, I think my first thought kind of links back to what everyone has just been saying. Um, you know, I think the tokenism element of a lot of diversity schemes that say, oh, we're going to hire more people from diverse backgrounds or we're just opening this job to people from diverse backgrounds. That's that's great. And we definitely need to get more people in the doors to start with. I think there's a bigger problem that, that publishing companies specifically don't look at as often, which is around retention. So when we get people in the door on these diversity schemes, how do we actually keep them and grow them and mentor them and give them the kind of confidence and, and make them feel like they belong there so they're going to work their way up the ladder? So eventually we don't have lots of, you know, white men in, and middle class men in these positions of power. So eventually that area, that top bit of the company becomes diverse as well. Um, and I think there's there's a lot of different ways to do that, you know, mentoring schemes, 
changing workplace culture, um, which I think I could talk about for, for hours. <laughs> I won't get into that that much, but you know, accessible work practices, flexible working, not having an industry that's mostly based in London. I think that's a big issue for, for many people. Whenever you bring up publishing, lots of people agree with that one. Um, that's got huge implications, disability, class, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I think sort of just changing the work practices that we have and changing the way that we support junior uh, employees and um, you know more networks in the industry that can support those people too and link them up with mentors and people who can give them advice that relates to their experience. Yeah, there's, there's so many suggestions and I'm sure everyone else probably has lots, lots as well. Um, brilliant. Thank you so much, Kat. Just for the sake of time, I am going to move on because I know we've got other areas that we need to cover. But thank you so much to everyone for your thoughts on kind of the publishing industry and the structures themselves. So, yeah, the kind of last question we want to ask is about who buys books. So kind of the consumer end of things. Um, and yeah, consider the reader's position in all of this. Um, and hence, we have uh, myself and Laura as kind of English literature graduates and readers um, to discuss this. Um, to again kind of preface this with some statistics, according to a, a report from the Booksellers Association, which surveyed 21 million people um, who listed books as a lifestyle interest, only 11.8 million of those people agreed with the statement, I am interested in other cultures and countries. So I think that really speaks to some of the things we were talking about regarding kind of the import export of the publishing industry and how it impacts the world, not just the UK as our kind of tiny island. Um, so I know myself and Laura were having a quick discussion kind of prior to this about what things we would talk about. And we were talking about things like the impacts of school syllabi, of book awards, which I know we've kind of touched on already. Um, but then how do we as readers impact back on the publishing industry and kind of see the diversity at work in publishing? Um, so Laura, would you like to? Um, so I was saying, I think beforehand is um, something that I've experienced is sort of a lack of transparency um, within the publishing industry. Like I, I've actively sort of researched into it. I, I did, a, you know, I did a creative writing degree and I still don't understand like precisely how a book gets from author to shelf. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't understand the process. And I think that sort of, um, I think we were discussing this, Ruth, that's, that's an interesting thing uh, as a writer, yes, but also as a reader, because we don't we don't understand how, like how how the books are made, uh, and uh, yeah, I think that that's a problem. I think some some level of transparency is is important. Um, I think would be important in in creating more opportunities and more opportunities for inclusivity as well. Um, I was also saying I was reflecting back um, in my my school. Um, I think every author I studied, bar one, was white, and we studied we studied one female author and a handful of um, there were a handful of female poets. But I was just remembering um, we studied metaphys metaphysical poetry at A level. Um, and there'd been a recent edition of a couple of um, female authors added, a couple of female poets added in. And uh, we were told, I was told by my, my female teacher, and I was at an all-girls school as well, um, that they were added in as, as a token and that they wouldn't be, they wouldn't come from the exam. And we didn't actually end up studying them because they didn't have, like, they weren't prioritised. Guess who came up in the exam? <laughs> That's right, your gal Catherine Mansfield um but uh I think that's that was really interesting because it came it came from a, like a woman and she was you know a strong powerful you know woman like a and we were an all-girls school and that was the message being taught to us as well yeah and oh go on oh no it's okay you, you I can. was just gonna say like we were kind of comparing like I guess horror stories from our times in like school um and I was saying um so we were at a mixed school it was boys and girls but the English department was female-led we had a female head of department and my English teacher was female but our set was segregated into boys and girls and the boys studied boys literature and the girls studied girls literature and we studied different books throughout and I realized that this is a strange practice that not many schools kind of underwent 
but it still kind of taught a whole co- cohort of students that there is women's literature that is mm-hmm. somehow viewed as lesser and there is men's literature which is somehow viewed as easier to read more accessible more diverse and that was absolutely horrifying and we were both saying it took until we got to university to actually start seeing some diversity in our reading lists and even then it still wasn't kind of as much as we would have hoped it to be yeah we had um we had a discussion earlier as well um so i um i'm i am a disabled writer um and i suffer from chronic health issues and it wasn't until i got to university that there was a model module called literature and medicine and it wasn't until i got to that point that i'd specifically studied you know works from people like me i guess in that sense um and yeah it, it was it was really interesting sort of the revelation that the work the work is out there somewhere i i just don't know where to find it yeah i think we were both saying that because we both studied mm-hmm. that module in different forms your undergraduate yeah. and me at um postgrad and um we'll give a shout out to dr sarah wasson who run who runs that module and she creates such wonderfully diverse reading lists and films and like different medias so you're not just reading the same things over and over um and that was the one module i think throughout my four years at university where i really experienced a huge range of writers from cultures from different countries of different backgrounds disabilities and all the other kind of i don't know protected characteristics that we talk about in law and it took until ma level for me to see that and that is so saddening I think uh, with that, that we were talking about um, how they um, they had a list of writing and what they didn't lack of data. Um, in Ruth's, uh, was it your fifth year, uh, Ruth, um, or, um, SCAN, um, which is Student Common at News, our, our student publication at Lancaster. Oh, is this and the I that- accidentally rocked the boat? <laughs> yeah yeah did. Um, um and like the lack of yeah diversity has not not improved much in the 10 years yeah since Kat was saying so um I have the statistics I did bring them up um mm-hmm. and this was four years ago now so they have worked on this since and that is a really good thing um but in my first year so on the core module that everyone studied there were only four women out of 15 core writers and only one one of those women were black on the world literature course, which of course is supposed to be kind of the more diverse module, um, there were only three women out of 21 core writers and only six of those writers were non-European. So again, you can just see there's uh, such inequality and lack of representation across all of these. Um, Benji, I can see you've raised your hand. Yeah, um, I decided to be good and just put my hand up um, rather than interject. Um, I'm glad that Lara raises the one of um scan and rocking the boat and everything like that because um as you can Lara know, I was involved with one of the other student media teams here at Lancaster, Delrig FM, 87.7 Delrig FM, this is my mind. Um sorry, I, I'm obligated to do that. Um and the number of times where we would take issue with something like that, something with the university or the students' union, and be told by someone who has who has a secure job with one of those organizations either oh we'll look into it not hear anything oh we can't deal with that right now we're too busy or just a lie just the number of times we were told something that was just either at the time we knew it to be objectively untrue or we found out later that it was untrue and i think that that really represents the problem where when trying to point out issues like this because we we were journalists, we were trying to say, hey, this is a problem and it's right in front of us, let's do something about it. You know, Ruth and Lara know, know what that's like. Um, and then getting pushed out because we were saying and asking uncomfortable things that, as, as Ruth put it, rocked the boat. And that that's deeply problematic. And the idea that, that a student at a university can say, hey, that doesn't seem quite right, only to then be met with either, I don't know what's more frightening, being told to shut up or being told a lie, that's deeply problematic. And I think raising awareness of how much students are pushed out of that kind of sharing of the power is incredibly important. 
this um, is oh, sorry right. no i was just gonna say um i think that raises a really interesting point about kind of um silencing mechanisms and like who mm. is allowed to speak in the publishing industry as well and um, but i just did want to speak to our english department's kind of praise a little bit in a sense raising these issues we have got the Athena swan certification which um it's kind of a bronze award where we mm. um it shows that we're working towards gender equality in the department and that involved a huge amount of data collection a huge amount of surveying um and a huge amount of work since and that has made such an impact that those modules have now started to change um it's a requirement for all new modules that are created to kind of consider their own representation and if there isn't then why so i know in um some pre-modern modules that's caused a bit of an issue because you know women weren't allowed to write and publish so how do we how do we tackle that um, and equally we have now got an EDI committee which stands for uh, equality diversity and inclusivity which acts as like a signposting and a um, structure through which students can raise issues and we have seen examples of that acting out quite recently which is amazing so yes rocking the boat can sometimes feel like you're shouting at a brick wall but sometimes it does raise really important points and actually causes change, which is amazing. Um, I know Laura had a point, but I'm gonna go um, to Sonali and then Jayran if that's okay, because people have hands raised. Uh, thanks, no, it's great. Um, it's really interesting to hear your stories. I was a bit horrified that you had to study women's literature as girls and men's literature as boys. That's a very weird concept that makes zero sense to me. Um, I just wanted to- Zero sense to me as well. <laughs> I just wanted to basically just agree and like provide other sort of examples of what, what an important role education plays. First and foremost, I just think that um, arts and humanities, specifically English, not English, but like literature should just be a compulsory course for everyone. I just think it, I just think it makes us all more like well-rounded human beings because for example, I come from India and a huge, if, a huge emphasis is laid on the sciences because that provides better stability, that provides you know, that assures you better stability or like assures you like better return on investment, for example, because we're still a developing country and there's less emphasis on the arts because it's a risky career. And just a lot of the problems I think would be solved if everyone just studied a bit more literature, because when you study literature, you also study history, philosophy, politics, psychology, and just you study a whole branch of humanities. And I am one of the case studies I would take of how literature and a good literature education can really help someone because I come from a semi-privileged background back in India and I come from a semi-conservative family as well. We fall, we, fall, we fall into the privileged sect when it comes to religion, skin color, um, socioeconomic class, et cetera, and location in India. So I grew up pretty cocooned and I didn't know any better because those were my experiences. And I went from a very posh school where, our, where literature education was just dismal. You shouldn't even talk about it. To the top university in India for uh, English literature, but it was a government subsidized university. So it was not fancy at all in terms of infrastructure. And my fees for the three years of my undergrad was like 300 pounds of total, my tuition fee. I spent more money on transport than I did on my actual tuition fee. And I have to say, it was some of the best education that I think I could have accessed. My faculty was amazing. The courses were amazing. We, I had nine total literature papers for the three years. And I studied Indian literature, the classics, the contemporaries. I studied all of British literature. So I know all about your classics. I studied Chaucer onwards to everything till now. I studied American literature. I studied Afro-Caribbean literature. I studied the Greek classics. I studied the Roman classics. So I feel like I got a really great foundational education when it comes to literature. But it was interesting when I came here for my creative writing master's degree, when I spoke to my American and British uh, counterparts, my peers, they had a very different syllabus that they came from. And they would mention, drop these names that I know I've heard of, but I never really cared to read them, whether they were American classics or British classics, some of them, because... They want my syllabus and I'm like the dead people and their culture or context relates in no way to mine. So I don't care to read them. And it's just interesting how 
I wish they had the chance to read more world literature like I did. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, that was my point. Okay. Jaren, really. I, so I just like carrying on about this point about education and I that I think Ruth when you professor stuff you said about the statistic about people not being interested in other cultures and I think that is it is literally because of um education it's because of you know I in schools are so we don't get taught um we don't even get taught much, at least from my experience, we didn't even get touch, taught much European literature or like Tolstoy or um, Victor Hugo. Um, and my mum told me that in her school um, in Iran, she got taught about these books from other countries and other cultures. So she had that interest kind of, kind of tricked and ingrained into her at a young age. I was brought uh, I come from a very white conservative town and as one of as the only Middle Eastern person in, in my year I found myself kind of being the spokesperson of every other country in the world whenever this topic would come up the rare occasions that it would come up I would be like oh but why why aren't we focusing on this or if I ask questions then or if the topic even came up, the other kids in the class would turn and look at me and be like, well, j -Ran, like, come on, it's your, speak up, it's your point. And I kept having to be like, well, why is it my place to talk? Why is it my place to ask these questions? Why am I, why is, why is a 12-year-old having to argue with an RE teacher about the syllabus or an English teacher about the syllabus? Um, and then when I got to GCSE and finally my first experience with a Middle Eastern book, it's The Kite Runner, which is an amazing book, but it's that, it's that story of like war and this narrative that we've been just, I don't know how many times we've heard it about uh, like war and immigration and why are those the stories that are highlighted? And it's an important story and it's, that doesn't demy, uh, that doesn't, put down what an amazing book The Kite Runner is and like what that accomplishes but as a kid uh, the stories that I would read or the heroes that I'd look up to none of them were none of them were described to look like me none of them had my heritage none of them had my experiences I would relate to their core emotional value but I wouldn't relate to their lived experiences and my lived experiences and other kids wouldn't be interested either if I were to tell them about I would force my friends to be like it's Persian New Year this is what we do and they'd be like we don't care and I'm like well you're gonna you're gonna care it only it only took when I got to university and I think that's because I was in a bubble where people had actively chosen to pay nine grand for an education because they wanted to learn more so they were actively interested and I was surrounded by people such as, you know, um, you guys who like uh, Benji, Ruth and Lara, I mean, who I went to uni with, um, who have that hunger and who would ask questions. And I was like, finally, it's, it's not just me having to be the spokesperson. It's not just me having to rock the boat. And I think when, when as, when you're a child, you're only, you know, you have an interest and you have a love, but you, society and uh, external factors play, you know, they play a massive part. And if, if you're not, if those external factors are telling you, well, this is the way it is and don't, don't be interested in anything else, then you're not going to be interested in anything else. I'm not really phrasing it very right, but it it's something which, um, because I've, I know that experience and I know those people who years later have been like, oh God, I wish, you know, um, I'm sorry, I'm babbling a little bit, but just to kind of summarize my point, um, my mum taught me Persian Farsi when I was little because she knew how much it would impact me in the long run. And because of that, uh, it, you know, I didn't enjoy it at the time. 
And I was like, why am I having to learn a different language? All the other kids at school are looking at me funny because I'm the brown kid who's like talking with my mom in a different language. And that's weird. Um, And my cousins who are in America, their parents, because they wanted so desperately to assimilate their kids into American culture, didn't teach them any Farsi. And just, uh, but then now as an adult, I now have this whole world and this whole other experience and this whole other culture that I feel connected to that my cousins are disconnected from. And I think that goes the same with writing. And like you said, uh, uh, Sonali, with like literature opens up this whole other world. And if we don't, from the ground level, from the root level, kind of give people those tools then they're not gonna they're not gonna have those critical thinking skills that then we then have as adults. Shush. Um, that was such a beautifully made point. Thank you, Joyran. Um, I am aware that we are kind of starting to run over time, um, but that people have their hands up and clearly kind of have points they want to raise. Um, so are people okay for sorry. us to carry on? <laughs> no, sorry. you're fine. Not at all. Um, are people okay for us to carry on, or would you kind of like to wrap it up? Um, I'm fine to carry on. Uh, I mean, it's locked down, yeah. nothing on. <laughs> um, yeah. I could stay on for like perhaps another 10 minutes, but I'll have to yeah, rush off. That's that. absolutely fine. Um, so if we go um, Sonali, Benji, Kat, and then Lara, I know you had a point, so I'll leave you with closing remarks. Okay. I just forgot to put my hand on. I'm fine. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Um, then go ahead, Benji. Uh, yeah, so a uh, point I want to raise is that obviously we, we've been talking about how key education is in addressing these issues. When people are made more aware of something, it's more difficult for them to push against it. You know, it's hard to get information, harder to get information out of your head than it is get it into your head. And I think an important part of educating people about um, other cultures, about other areas of the world that they have very little awareness of because their education system has failed them is it's not always these revivalist renaissance kind of approaches you know it's not always oh new literature that's coming out of these you know all of these poor countries that you know how they're referred to in in the wider consciousness um there are there is ancient ancient knowledge that we only have you know but the foundations of our culture are built on things from other cultures what are now countries that where where western world powers carry out an assortment of different military operations i mean e- even the more perverse things that people try to take pride in like the fact that we had an empire well the mongol empire the, the king dynasty you know the, the, these things were all comparable in scope and scale um you know you've got mesopotamia as being possibly the seat of civilization philosophy mathematics you know, ancient literature all coming from areas that we no longer consider developed. And I think that's an important part of the important thing to make people aware of is that these are not just new outreach programs. These are ancient cultural, historical, socio-political ties that predate Britain as a country. And I think that's a really important thing to make people aware of because it makes them realize that there is an existence before everything that we have an awareness of because it's what our education system deemed important to make us aware of. Um, Thank you. I'll just go straight to Kat. Thanks. Um, I think my point's probably a bit old now (laughs) because I couldn't figure out how to raise my hand. I forgot how to do it. Um, So I'm a bit late on the raising hand function. Um, So I think it kind of relates back to what J-Rom was saying so, so perfectly. Um, I guess about the kind of value of, of reading and why it's important that we do read diversely, which is something to kind of keep returning to, isn't it? And, and for something to kind of keep reminding publishers of is I think there's kind of two strands to it. So first of all, it's important to read diversely, to read experiences that aren't your own. To This is why I read. I want to hear about people who have experienced things that I never would. I want to know what the world is like through their eyes. And then secondly, the, the value in reading is reading things where you see yourself reflected um which isn't happening for a lot of people i mean i i don't think i'd read a really really good book on disability that really spoke to my specific experience until last week 
that's the first time I've ever read a book and I thought oh that's me like that is what I've been through and I wish I had that 10 years ago and I was really struggling with this so there's a real value in that too um and I think related to that that second purpose of reading we have to be a bit wary about what we expect people to write about as well so if you're kind of part of a certain marginalized group there's often an expectation that you will write purely about your experiences of having that identity which I think is what is what Jayron was saying really and I'm just talking about um, disability as well from my experiences you know you shouldn't always as a disabled person have to write a story that's about disability you could just have a, a character or a protagonist with a disability in a fantasy series or as part of a rom-com and that's just it's just incidental that their identity is different from the mainstream or, or what's kind of usually represented um, so I think that's something we have to be careful of and there's something we have to learn about as well the publishing industry has to learn about as well as is considering the diversity of their readership because I think that's something having come from working in publishing that that isn't done very well um, and my, yeah my last quick point is that um, there's a really good report on this called Rethinking Diversity in Publishing um, in association with Spread the Word, which some of you might have read. Um, and they talked about how there's a very limited view of who readers are and how people in publishing very much think readers are, you know, in urban metropolitan centres, mostly London. They're educated, they're white, they're middle class, etc. They have a very narrow view of who wants to read books. Um, and that's the real problem because then stories they were talking about kind of BAME communities writing stories that get whitewashed or exoticized for white audiences. Um, but it's the same with, with many marginalized groups. They get packaged in a way that fits that audience and they don't think about readers more widely. Um, that was a lot of points in one. <laughs> I was trying to say a lot at once. Um, I think that's probably everything I wanted to say. Um, thank you, Kat. And I think you're right. There are so many points to say on this. And this is just a kind of starter taste of discussion on all of these issues. Um, I think you're entirely right that we often are trying, so desperate to shoehorn people into certain groups of like, well, you're part of this marginalised group and you're part of this marginalised group. But people are far more complex than that. And sometimes we just need to give them the space to be as complex individuals rather than trying to shoehorn people in. Um, I know um, Lara had a point and I think, uh, Sonali, have you just raised your hand again? Yep. Okay, great. So we'll go uh, Lara then Sonali. Okay, Doug. So I sort of have two things. One, I think, Jaren, you were talking about the Kite Runner. Um, interestingly, the one non-white author at my school was um, Carlotta Sini. We did A Thousand Splendid Sons. So it seems that also even in trying to represent diversity, there's there's sections within the diversity that that people are like, well, no, this this is the diverse book you read. And, and I think that's actually a horrifying kind of interesting point there. Um, and also in talking about sort of, uh, I think we were discussing earlier about guarding sort of in the publishing industry, like you have to go through lots of different people. Um, I know at uh, Lancaster, we um, we had an issue a little bit in, uh, surrounding the careers fair. Um, so we went to, we had a careers fair and there were so few creative options like there were there weren't anything for publishing there was like one thing for journalism and it was like they'd forgotten about the arts industry altogether so so in trying to to get anyone into it and to encourage like the these you know um opportunities and inclusion for everyone there's there, there's a a, a really difficult route in valuing the arts i think like you were saying Snarly as well, like valuing literature and valuing the arts within education and, and as viable sort of career opportunities, um, I think needs to be addressed. Um, thank you, Lara. And just to kind of add to that, Lara then did also go and write an article, which then led to a uh, focus group, which involved both of us on why we needed to promote the arts careers and creative careers. And now there is a whole team who kind of specialise in that and hold events about how we get um, kind of into the creative industries and run paid internships so that people can gain work experience. So again, um, yeah, it's worth raising voices to make actual change on the ground. Um, Sonali, I will leave you with the last point. 
<laughs> well, that's a lot of pressure. Uh, good on both of you for like taking that cause up and then creating change. That is great. Um, I guess my point is to do with Jiran and Kat's points. Um, I my current novel work in progress is with a big publisher, and the feedback that I receive from them in the preliminary stages, um, it is. I am Indian and I come from the slumdog millionaire nation, which all of us back home in India hate because it's basically poverty born and depicts India in a certain way. And for the next decade or so, I had to feel questions about, oh, is this how really India is? And it's just really annoying and just none of us really appreciate it. So I agree with Jiran that even when you read diverse books, diverse literature, I guess it's to make it make foreign reading more pal- palatable and like appetizing for and like for like white readers and painting these countries in certain ways it does tend to be just poverty porn or like migrant stories or horror stories of growing up in these countries and that's not i'm not saying that poverty doesn't exist in these countries but i'm saying that's not everyone's experience of growing up in these nations so i think i will know for sure that changes happened is when the kind of book that i'm writing would hit the market one day which is it is just really fun adventure fantasy you know fast-paced book it just happens to be set in india it just happens to have an indian cast of characters but even when i sent it to a big publisher with this whole like some like this knowledge given to them in a covering letter saying this is what i intend to do i got asked this they said that i hadn't created enough distance in my world of what india is and what in india the country so they couldn't they couldn't accept the fact that i just chose to write my fantasy story within india the country they thought if i'm basing it in india it needs to be like a fantastical version of india which doesn't make sense to me because we have superhero stories set in the us all the time and we have you know harry potter set in the, the uk there are no issues with that so i didn't really understand this sort of feedback and i had another point which i'm forgetting now um so it mustn't be that important. So yeah, I'll just end with that. <laughs> um, fantastic. I think we will end it there so that we can all kind of go and enjoy the rest of our evening in peace. Um, but I just wanted to say a massive thank you for this discussion. Everyone's given such amazing and insightful points. We've kind of covered so much and there are so many more questions that I'm sure we could all kind of unpick and question each other on for hours to come. Um, yeah, I just want to say a huge thank you and such a fantastic discussion and hopefully it all opens some doors for people. Thank you.